Good morning, everyone. The uh, Mackinac Bridge Authority will now be called to order. Today's date is uh, March 11, 2022. If I could have the uh, bridge director uh, call the roll, please. Chairman Gleason? Here. Here. Vice Chair Trey Gee? Here. Member Kinley? Here. Here. Member Milliken? Present. Present. Member Steidel? Here. Member Cheeseman? Here. Council Gleason? Here. And if you would uh, have the record uh, note that uh, Director Hodgebaugh is joining us on Zoom. Members, the uh, first item on the agenda is the approval of the agenda. A motion would be in order to do approve it. I'll make that motion. It's been moved. Is there support to the motion? Support. Any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, all in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Our next item on the agenda is public comment. Uh, normally speaking, it's on the agenda items only, but sir, if you uh, come down to address the authority, we'll see, uh, hear from you now, instead of waiting all the way through the agenda, as you're courteous. Well, in last year, a couple of us farmers bought a cabin chassis ram. They're a one-ton pickup that doesn't come with a bed. The only difference between them and a regular one-ton is, is they come bare, so you can put any type of bed you want. Well, the way the bridge has been for at least 20 years, if the bed's wider than the cab, taller than the cab, you get charged $10. Well, a cabin chassis ram, which I printed off from Chrysler's website, carries less weight than a regular one-ton. So to get charged $10 instead of $4 seems kind of unfair. Well, if you know what a 450 Ford is, that's a ton and a half truck. You can get them in any configuration. You can still get them with a pickup bed. Those can haul 47,000 pounds. A Ram one ton is at 37,000. So why would I pay 10 bucks when they pay $4? Well, then if I haul my trailer for the farm, I'm paying $20. Well, a single axle semi with a 53 foot trailer only pays $20. I'm paying the same amount as a semi that can haul 67,000 pounds. So it's kind of, when I talked to Mr. Mike, you know, he said, well, what could you do about it? All trucks that are 450 and up should be charged the $10 because they are plated no matter what in the state of Michigan as a commercial vehicle because the gross vehicle weight of the truck itself is 10,000 or more. So it's or, there's nothing you can go around that. A cabin chassis can be plated any way you want because of the weight of it, because it doesn't have a bed. Well, the rules state the reasoning behind the flatbed is you can haul more weight. Well, that's incorrect. If, you're the, if it only can haul 30,000 pounds, it don't matter if you have a bed on it or a flatbed, you're still only allowed a combined weight. And when I say 30,000, that means truck, trailer and the weight on the trailer it's called the g the gcwr gr gross combined weight rating well if i take the bed off my truck then you guys only charge me four dollars well how does that make a difference that means i can still haul the same thirty thousand pounds if i had the bed or not so we're it just doesn't make sense to us it's a personal vehicle i go back and forth to doctor's appointments and then some people ask well why would you buy that well they're cheaper right now the price of the trucks right now are averaging eighty, ninety thousand dollars. Well, why not buy a cheap truck? And it's still, and then it's derated also for the power because if they are used as a commercial vehicle, people they buy them because then guys only can go seventy-seven miles per hour. That's what most of them are governed at. Also, they don't have the horsepower to tear out the rear end. And if you look at wreckers, wreckers like the Ram and the forty-five hundred and fifty-five hundred can't come with a pickup bed. Before they call them 450 and 550, you can still get them with a pickup bed. 
well, they're a commercial vehicle no matter what, so why do they get away with $4 and I'm paying 10 Now, I understand when a box truck comes, because you never know, DOT, everybody knows what the DOT is at the bridge. They weigh them trucks because people hide what's in there because they're sides. Well, that's obvious. Most people aren't driving a truck with a 20-foot bed or longer that's boxed as a personal vehicle. But horse people, as you know, you know, the UP, there isn't a lot of industry left. They go and buy a fancy flatbed just like I got on my truck to put your stuff in the side. Two, nothing against women, but women are usually shorter. I'm not very tall. Don't want to reach over a pickup bed to get their stuff out of the back. So if they have a flatbed, they can get inside of it easier. And again, the flatbed is no heavier than a regular pickup bed if you have an aluminum one. And like I said, I've looked over all the rules that you guys have listed, and it states on there because of the larger weight capacity. Well, then how does it work for a three-quarter ton? That's like it stated, a three-quarter of a ton, you put a flatbed on it, you're charged $10. So that's a single axle truck. It's capacity payload, which that's the amount of weight you're allowed to haul in the back. It's still only set at a certain amount. So if you have no bed on it, you're still only allowed so much on that rear axle. Same goes for the one ton. The only time it starts changing is, is when you bump up to the 450 and the 550 and, of course, the semi. And sometimes I drive semi. I don't know if Mr. Mike knows. I The Bonacci's in the Sioux, Norris, they're the bigger companies up there. When they take a single axle semi across the bridge, it's $20 if you have a two axle tandem trailer. Well, why are they allowed to go for 10, you know, 10 bucks for the truck, 10 for the trailer? I go across, I'll be empty, I'm charged $20. I can't even, I call half of what they haul. And it's even less than that, because if they're allowed 60, 67,000, that printed off the DOT laws, it just, it just seems, you know, astronomical that I'm paying that out. So if I go to a doctor's appointment, which everybody knows the UP doesn't, you'd have to go to Marquette, I gotta go to U of M, Every time I cross and I don't get a free return, that's 20 bucks just for my pickup. And right now, I mean, of course, I'm, I got a nice car, but it's a Challenger. It's a Hellcat. Got to wait till summer. I'm being penalized to drive my truck. And I'm already getting penalized at the pump. Everybody knows right now we all are. $5 a gallon for diesel, you know. So it's just we're trying to figure it out because everybody right now is trying to save money, especially in the UP. Cabin chassis trucks are cheaper. You're saving some more money, you know, and now, of course, now we're not saving the money. It's adding up. And my one of my best friends, he owns Jarvie Farms. They're a big family up in the UP also, just like mine. His, he hauls more weight than I do. A regular one ton can haul 7,000 pounds more than my cabin chassis. One is because of the horsepower difference, the braking difference. He goes across. He pays the 4 bucks for the truck and so much for the trailer. I go across. He laughs at me like we joke, and he goes, man, that's got to get expensive. So he doesn't even have me haul his stuff anymore unless we can get the additional money to haul hay because everybody knows we're in UP. We have to go so far in lower Michigan. And, you know, if they want to charge me more money when I'm hauling something, that's understandable. But when I just take the truck just across the empty, how is it justifiable to charge me $10 when he goes across and he's $4? They say the width, well, if you measure the duals, the outside of the fender on a regular pickup box, it's still the same width because there's a law. You're not allowed over eight and a half feet to begin with. But the bed's only wide from the back of the cab back on mine, but it's still only so wide at the wheels. A regular dually, it just sucks in and comes back out. So it's just, it's just, it's just getting old for us to pay that. And every other trucker, you know, they laugh. They're like, well, I'm just buy a semi for what they're charging you. So it's like, I'm gonna go buy a single axle semi, go to a doctor's appointment. And I don't know about you right now, I'm not paying an extra 20 to 30% for a car to buy another one. And my Hellcat insurance, I have a speeding problem, so I don't want to pay the four or five hundred dollars a month, and you know, for insurance right now. And two, in the winter, that car cost me ninety grand. The car sits, you know. Kind of wish it was a lease, because then I could beat it up and be like, all right, I'm done with it, take it back. So I, that's why I came down here because I don't know if uh, Mr. Mike he looked was going to look at my account. You can just see I crossed a bridge, and that adds up. Well, why do I got to pay two hundred bucks a week at least to cross it? It's like, dang, I might as well buy another vehicle. Because you add that up, and then come summertime, like I said, if I'm going across it commercially, then I could understand it. But I think it's unfair that it needs to change. And I know it's hard because the toll booth people, let's say they see 2,000 people a day. Some of them don't understand the differences in vehicle. But there should be a, lot, there should be a, a different rule going, if it says 450 on the side, because you're supposed to register it and be honest, 
it's a 450, no matter what, it's a commercial vehicle. If it's get a big box on it, it's obvious it's commercial. If it's a big, long bed, it's obvious when they're extremely long. When you got a rollback or a wrecker, those are commercial. That's understandable. But it's, I remember when I was young, when I first joined the Army, and I don't know if any of you remember it, we had a couple problems, and I don't remember who the director was back then. It was back in, like, 2002. A lady kept charging me for crossing the bridge with my plow, saying it was over with. So she was charging me an extra, like, back then it was like $1.50 or something. And I argued it. I went to the office. There was some lady in there. She called somebody and says, no, we'll, we'll take care of that, and he gave me my money back. Well, now it's like I'm, like, in the same boat. It's like, well, I'm, I just I don't understand how, to be pe how I can be penalized for buying a cheaper truck with an aluminum flatbed and like I said, the justification, the rules, and I understand there's rules, that's why I'm disputing it. It says on there, it's because of the increased waste capacity you could haul. We can't haul anymore. You're still on a set law. There's a set amount of payload and a towing capacity. If anything, you haul less than the bed of the truck because the bed would weigh more, but you're still, if the bed payload says 5,000, you have no bed, you're still only allowed 5,000 on the axle. If you got a flatbed on it, well, if the flatbed weighs 2,000, then you're only allowed 3,000 on the back axle. So that's why I like, came to argue it, because it's just, if anybody, if you know anything about commercial vehicles, your title says what the vehicle is. And like my title says, I mean, it's a personal vehicle. And then like my license plate says disabled veteran, so I get that 100% don't pay for the tag. So I just, I don't know. And I printed off all the stuff off the actual Ford, Chrysler website, shows their capacities. Mine's a 14 Ram. I got in my 18. My 14 Ram hauls like, isn't even really allowed to haul the weight. The DOT's been letting me get by. So they've been gracious enough not to give me tickets. But it's it's 30,000. The new Ram one ton's 37,500. Uh, 2023 Ram, they're talking about 42,000. The Ford 550's 47,000 pounds. You know, so I understand we gotta pay for wear and tear on the bridge. You know, that makes sense. But these snowmobile trailers and these campers, that's another thing. You look at what they only Mr. pay. Chairman? Mr. Chairman, yeah. can we can we move on? I think we got this. Yeah. Yeah. I, w I just wanted to thank you for coming up here. And I, I want you to understand that. I love that you know weights and axles, and, but it's about weight, axle spacing, gross weight, and the profile, okay? So when you have a weird profile coming through, what we do as structural engineers is we model 28 different configurations. Yep. And if it's different, then you have to apply for a special permit because a structural engineer has to take your information and do a finite load rating to make sure that it's gonna be safe for you and for the bridge. Yes, no, I understand okay? that. So and that $10 an hour is not what a structural engineer makes. It's no, I understand more. that. Okay. so. Just, I mean, I think you answered your own question. And this, that's where I was to told you the structural vehicle. is still the same as a regular pickup box because at the wheels, it's still, let's say it's 124 inches wide. Okay, I, th I think we just were gracious you know. to let you speak before our meeting, but everybody has different things to do. I'm sure Kim and Julie and you can, you can answer all this, right? But put it into a way that seems fair and equitable. And if not, if we have to come up with a special, you know, truck, Maybe that's a solution. Does that sound good? Yeah, well that's why I just that's why I wanted just the answer on is why is the semi and they and myself paying the same amount. That's what it, we I wanted to know the justification on that when there's thirty seven thousand pounds difference and I'm paying the same amount. You said profile. Well a semi is another three, four feet at least taller and another like well, foot wider minimum. I think uh, we understand your concern here. We'll take it under advisement. We'll certainly sit down with staff, and if need be, if there is a possible way we could do something here, we'll probably submit it to the fares, uh, fees, and committee to review it. We certainly under understand your point. We'll take it under advisement and work with staff to see if there is a possible resolution to where it doesn't um, throw the whole system into uh, a tither, okay? Yes, sir. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Appreciate it. And drive careful. Yep. Especially with the Hellcat. <laughs> oh, I got <laughs> so. Is there anyone from the public wishing to uh, comment on agenda items? Hearing none, uh, we'll move right under uh, item three. Uh, I'll turn it over to Kim at this time. We had an uh, excellent meeting with Senator Broom yesterday. Kim? 
Yes, um, we did have a good meeting with Senator McBroom yesterday um, talking about interoperability between tolling agencies, and I gave you some handouts on your uh, table there with the latest report from Fagan Consulting about that subject. And if you remember, we discussed this two years ago in March, um, and this report has been updated to the current facts and figures. Um, along with that, there's a handout of a um, PDF of a slideshow on the same topic. And these are the things we discussed with Senator McBroom, McBroom yesterday. Um, we had a good discussion and um, agreed to share some information between ourselves. The Senator has some access to some origin destination studies that were done for some tourist locations in the UP that will be valuable for us. And then we have, um, we agreed to look at this in a, um, a more general nature and involve some of the other tolling agencies in the state in the discussion. So that's, that's it in a nutshell, um, our discussion with Senator McBroom. Thank you, Kim. Uh, I'd just like to add that I really did appreciate the uh, time that we had with Senator McBroom yesterday. And I would also like to thank uh, Troy Hagan from MDOT. He was very helpful in, in the meeting as well. And, and certainly Kim's input was much uh, appreciated as well. So is there any comments, questions about uh, the meeting with Senator McBroom? Hearing none, we'll move right along to committee reports. Uh, the first report will be from our finance chair, uh, Vice Chair Amy Trey. Thank you. So it was a great <coughs> update uh, yesterday. We held the meeting at 3 in the afternoon, and we had full board participation, but the finance committee was here as a whole, so it was really nice to be back with everybody. Um, we were given an investment update, which uh, shows that we're really not just on target, but ahead of our expectations regardless of how COVID and other things have been impacted. Um, the, the Treasury Department had to kind of do an update from the slides that were presented because of uh, everything that's going on in the world and having a tremendous impact potentially. Um, but they're already being very proactive with our investments to make sure that we're, we're um, on track. Um, also got an update from, let's see, it's right here. Our business plan was presented by the CFO of the Mackinac Bridge Authority, and it was um, approved to be accepted, and it shows that we are doing a fabulous job. When I say we, I mean the CFO and, and, and Kim um, staying to our budget and actually exceeding it. This year is called like a, not a gap year, reserve, we, we're in the, Recovery, thank you. We're in a recovery year, which is fantastic. Um, we also had an external auditor, Plant Moran, come in to review our finances, and uh, it came back like stellar. No material findings, there was nothing um, fraudulent, there was nothing going on that wasn't properly um, estimated, and so uh, hats off, just a fabulous report overall. Um, I don't think I'm missing anything here. The, so the audit was approved, and then the business plan was approved as well. So uh, any other things to add? Mr. Chairman, I'd make a motion to accept the um, Finance Committee's reports, the audit, and the business plan. Support? It's been moved support and supported that we accept the uh, finance financial report. Is there any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, all in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Thank you, Amy. <coughs> Next, uh, we have under 4B, we have the report from the chair of the uh, annual Bridge Walk Revenue Committee. Uh, Caroline, the floor is yours. Okay, we held um, two meetings, one in December and one in January. Um, the reason that I believe we were asked to do this is because there were indications from the Michigan State Police that um, they might ask to be fully reimbursed for their expenses for the 2022 walk. And we wanted to be prepared for that. Um, 
currently their total costs are 350,000 and the MBA uh, reimburses them for 150,000. The total bridge walk expenses are approximately 350,000 and so that additional 200 would have been a 57% increase to what was budgeted for the bridge walk. Um, it should be noted that since the time of our last meeting, the Michigan State Police has said that they do will not look to any further reimbursement from the Mackinac Bridge Authority. They will keep it at one around 150,000. Um, and the cost of the 2022 bridge walk is already budgeted and approved um, by the MBA. Um, Also, uh, we looked at future funding options should we want to look for them to offset tolls that are used to pay for the bridge walk or should we have increases in the future. And we considered donations but um, Ms. Gleason pointed out that by statute we do not have the authority to accept donations and there was some question as to whether or not donate donated funds could be used to pay the hourly work, or not hourly, but the workers' wages that are spent on the bridge walk. Um, in light of that, we looked for some other viable funding sources, and it was suggested that the Michigan Economic Development Corporation, or MEDC, could possibly partner with the bridge uh, for the bridge walk. Um, it's my understanding that the Peer Michigan campaign is handled by the MEDC. And I know that in the past, um, on, the, on the bridge walk certificates that people receive, there have been things on the back with the North Country Trail and the Iron Bell Trail, and it might be fitting, a good fit for the Bridge Authority to consider um, asking them for funds. And it was also mentioned that MDOT might be a possible source of funding. Uh, one of the concerns that came up uh, in was <clears throat> Our first meeting was shortly after the Oxford school shooting, and the day after some lawsuits were filed against the administrators and possibly teachers. I'm not certain about that, but it was more than just the school board. And so we got into a certain amount of discussion about liability for the MBA and the authority members, um, considering that there has been some gun a gun discharged on the bridge, I won't say gun violence, but it's, it's a consideration since we don't have bag checks. And um, so we got on a discussion about that. Um, also, we looked at, um, well, excuse me, I've kind of lost my place here, but we thought that the authority should possibly consider any safety ramifications, but also after that, it came to my attention that when there are safety problems, the Michigan State Police tells us. They do uh, analysis, or that's probably not the correct word, but they look to see if, what our safety considerations are, and they would advise us if there was a situation where we should not have the bridge walk. Um, so I guess our recommendation would be to possibly check with the MEDC or MDOT if the authority would like us to continue along these lines or if they would just like it to go the way that it has been and use toll revenue for the funding. Uh, yeah, that, Chairman? I would also share that my sister, um, well, the former authority member, Barbara Brown, did sit in on the meetings with us because she uh, told us how they funded the 50th, uh, 50th anniversary celebration. Um, most of what happened with that really was not applicable for a repeat um, event, annual event. And that's my report. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Caroline. You're welcome. Kurt. Mr. Chairman, I'd make a motion to accept the committee's uh, report, I guess, yeah, the, the report. Um, I would further make a, uh, a suggestion that uh, we continue to look at future opportunities, but the discussion is not impacting the 2022 walk, so there's no misunderstanding. 
uh, that uh, you know, this year is as normal. Uh, we continue to discuss and look for future opportunities. Is there support to that motion? I'll support it. I also have a, a, a comment. Uh, we're certainly grateful for the uh, level of support that the Michigan State Police have provided us. But I, I wanted to ask, they operate um, in St. Ignace in a facility next to right. us. And I wanted to know if that's a Michigan State Police facility or if that's a Mackinac Bridge Authority facility. The building is ours. Thank you. And I second the motion. <laughs> <laughs> It's been moved and supported that we accept the uh, uh, the report from uh, the committee chair, uh, Caroline Cheeseman. Is there any discussion on the motion? I would just like to add one thing that I appreciate all the work and input from Amy and Tricia, the committee members, and from Kim and uh, Barbara Brown, and from. Uh, wise guidance from Shorty. <laughs> and you too. Well, the other, thank the other you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the other Gleason. All in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Thank you again, Caroline. Excellent job. Okay, we're on to item five, uh, the approval of uh, many me me meeting minutes since our last meeting. Uh, there's five sets of minutes, we can take them individually or we can use one motion to get them all. Mr. Kurt? Chairman, I'd make a motion to accept all the committee, or I'm sorry, all of the minutes to the uh, meetings as noted on the agenda. I'll second that motion. It's been moved supported to accept all the uh, minutes of the meetings that are uh, listed on your agenda. All in favor, if there's no discussion, all in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Great. We'll uh, move right on to old business now. Under old business, the first item, number six, is a North Vidoc span project, and that is with Cole. And is Julie able to join us yet? She's not on yet. Okay. Good morning, Cole. Good morning, uh, board members. Uh, so, uh, the North Viaduct Rehabilitation Project, uh, I highlighted it in our October board meeting. At that time, we were creating the specs and preparing the, the project for um, to secure a consultant to help us with the design of the project. Um, so since that time, we did finish that up. Uh, we put it out for proposal, and uh, we did receive four proposals for this project, all from very good uh, companies. But um, ultimately, the selection team selected Parsons, who the board will be familiar with. Uh, they performed the 2020 deck study for us, which this project is a result of that study. Um, and they're, after doing that study, they're very familiar with what's needed on this project. Um, I'll just remind everybody, the North Viaduct project, uh, spans are the portion of the bridge that's located on the causeway uh, between Pier 34 and Pier 48. So relatively, it's a small section of the bridge, but um, it's definitely a portion that needs some uh, rehabilitation. Um, so next slide. So as part of this project, one of the things we're going to be doing is replacing all of the joints on the spans. The majority of those joints are fairly standard. Uh, there's actually an M dot standard detail that we can replace those joints with, and we had uh, great success doing that in the South Viaducts in 2011. But there is one joint that I didn't talk about in October. That's uh, the joint at Pier 34. So this joint uh, has to accommodate more expansion. So it currently exists as a finger joint, which, as you can see, it's kind of like it, it has fingers. Um, so it allows for more movement. But finger joints have one big issue, which is their open joints. So you can see in that one picture they allow water through, which allows water on the steel below, which can cause corrosion and things. So we're looking at this project to, to replace that finger joint with what's called a modular joint. In, in civil engineering terms, it's, it's fairly, a, it's a new joint, like I said, in civil engineering terms, but um, the big benefit is that it's actually a sealed joint. So it's made up of uh, multiple little uh, steel pieces that are actually 
sealed in between um, as, as shown in that diagram there. So we thought this project would be a good opportunity to see how a modular joint will work on the Mackinac Bridge because with the deck replacement coming up and things, we're going to have a lot more joints that we're going to be replacing down the road. So uh, we'll see if this one hopefully is successful. Uh, next slide. Uh, another portion of this project is uh, concrete repairs. It's fairly standard when, because we are going to be resurfacing the North Viaduct project, or the North Viaduct spans. And when we pull off the old asphalt, it just makes sense to fix all the concrete underneath. And luckily, because of that deck study, we know the concrete's actually in pretty good shape, especially for the bridge being as old as it is, um, the concrete's really held up well. So we're not anticipating a lot of concrete repairs, but it's just a good time to do it when you pull that asphalt off. Uh, so this is, these pictures are actually from a repair we did in-house in 2020, um, which is a good example where basically if, if there's some concrete we find that has, is deficient, you, you take all that concrete out until you get into sound concrete, you clean up all the steel reinforcement and then you, you replace the concrete. So we'll be doing that as part of this project. Next slide. And then, of course, the last part is the resurfacing aspect of it. Um, the big, this was the big draw with Parsons, is they teamed up with a company called Materials Testing Consultants out of Grand Rapids, who will actually be performing some laboratory tests. And when Parsons did that deck study, they took some cores out of the deck um, and they retain those. So they're actually sending those to materials testing consultants. They're gonna be doing some laboratory tests and basically seeing, we believe the last resurfacing was done in 2008 and we believe that, that all the tests showed so far that that asphalt was successful in keeping water out of the bridge. And so basically by getting these further tests done, we can improve upon that design and again, get as impermeable of a riding surface as possible because again, it's about keeping water out of the concrete and out of the deck. So um, this, these pictures are actually from 2008 when they were resurfacing the bridge and that engineer there is performing permeability tests to, as they were placing it, just making sure the asphalt was doing its job. So we'll be doing that again. So, um, next slide. Is there a waterproofing membrane that goes between the concrete and the asphalt? Um, we have used a waterproofing membrane in certain sections of the bridge in the past, and we didn't have a lot of success. And that's basically because um, when we resurface the bridge, we mill it, and then it creates an uneven surface. So getting the membrane to adhere to it uh, <coughs> was difficult. As part of the project during the design, which will be taking place over the next year, um, Parsons is going to be looking at a sprayable, like epoxy type of waterproofing membrane. Um, so we'll see what, what their study yields. We, we think it might be too expensive to be practical, practicable for this project, but um, we are going to be looking into that as well, in addition to the um, impervious asphalt design. Any other questions? Any questions from the authority members? As always, Cole, excellent job. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. And thank you for all your good work, too. I appreciate it. Um, so I guess I'll, it looks like Julie is on, but uh, I'll introduce our next presentation is going to be from Guy Meadows, who also presented at the October board meeting about the high frequency radar we had installed at the Bridgeview Park. And that's uh, something taken on by Michigan Tech. So, Guy, if you can hear me, uh, you should be uh, all set to go. Thank you. Loud and clear. <clears throat> Good morning, um, Chairman Gleason morning, and Guy. distinguished members uh, of the board. Good morning. It's a great opportunity to update you on the U.S.'s first operational freshwater radar system and to thank you once again for, for being uh, such a gracious partner in this in this research effort. Um, next slide, please. Uh, 
Hi. Good morning, Guy. If, if you could start over, uh, we missed the first part of your presentation. Thank you very Great. much. Yes, sir. Uh, Chairman Gleason and members of the board, uh, I would like to thank you for um, helping us establish the first U.S. Uh, freshwater radar system ever. Um, and to, it's an opportunity I, I greatly appreciate to bring you up to date here on our successes thus far. Uh, this is the uh, layout of the radar system. There is a transmitter receiver at both the south station, uh, east, uh, west of the bridge, as well as uh, north of the bridge on, at Bridgeview Park. Um, there are two, during the navigation seasons, two operational data buoys uh, within the footprints of the radar. And uh, with our collaborations with the Great Lakes Environmental Research Laboratory of NOAA in Ann Arbor, we have a tremendous numerical uh, capability to predict flows through the Straits of Mackinac. So not only is the radar system providing up-to-date maps of the surface flow, but it is also a very exciting research site, and that has been acknowledged by our sponsors, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration uh, in Silver Springs, Maryland. So we're very excited about the performance uh, thus far. Next slide, please. As you may recall, uh, we did permanent installations at both the north and south site. Uh, during the July or June July timeframe, and we went fully operational on October 18th of 2021. Uh, we used a local contractor, Darrell Brothers, uh, to do the on-site work. Uh, in our opinion, uh, they did a, a tremendous job. Um, we hope we we left the uh, territory in in as good or better condition than when we set up. So. Uh, it'd be good to hear from you if, uh, if there's any concerns, but it was a very first class installation. All the underwater underground cabling uh, was placed in conduit um, with the intent of, of this system operating uh, continuously for at least the next 10 years or so. Um, next slide, please. I'm going to, to show you uh, the type of information that we have acquired uh, since going operational in, in October. But to refresh everyone's memory, this is the surface current flow that we typically see. Uh, it extends about four miles in, in all directions. Um, the bigger the arrows and the brighter color the arrows are represent the magnitude of the surface flows. And for comparison, these bright green to yellow uh, flows are in the order of 50 centimeters per second, which is about one nautical mile per hour. So we see a very wide distribution of flows in most of these images. Uh, uh, a reversal, you can see beginning on the north side. Uh, and as we expected, the, the surface flows in the straits are extremely complex. The radar system produces one of these maps once an hour continuously. And the next slide, please. The next slide, slide is a movie of those one hour time steps uh, for the entire month of November 2021. I, I won't make you watch all of these, but it shows the consistency and how dynamic and reversible that the flows are every few days. And you can see that when the flow reverses, it reverses in very complex ways. Um, and when you see blank spots like that, recall the radar is sensitive to short wind waves on the water surface. And if there are no wind waves uh, on, a, on a flat calm day, then we do not see the underlying currents. So that is one of the uh, drawback conditions of, of radar sensing of this, uh, of, of this type. Um, your big, beautiful bridge um, has been a challenge in removing uh, its influence from the radar system. And we spent, uh, with the manufacturer, about two months making these images as, as clear as possible. And again, we're about halfway through the month uh, at this point. So 
we have also been working, if you could go to the next slide, I think, I think we see the purpose here. We have been working on making that data fully available to everyone, including the general public, and that has been completed. So there are several ways to get to the data. Uh, one on the top there is if you go to the Michigan Tech University Great Lakes Research Center site and click on our buoy and observational data window, uh, which is the second panel down, that will take you directly to our buoy page and radar page now and that will provide uh, access to all of this data instantly. Our sponsor, the Great Lakes Observing System, GLOSS, um, we have also worked closely with them over the last couple months, and their uh, website uh, in the lower corner there is also fully operational now to record uh, and provide that data. So there's a number of ways to, to get to the data. Next slide, please. This is our uh, buoy and radar page now. And if something is outlined in red, as all the buoys are, that means they have not reported recently. Um, they are all out uh, across all of the Great Lakes uh, for the winter season, but the radar is the only sensing system that continues to operate and it's outlined in yellow. And if you click on that yellow box on the left-hand panel, it will take you to the HF radar site, which is the right-hand panel in this this view graph and you can select from that slide any of those any dates or any months since October and it will show you the the most recent data next slide please also at the Michigan Tech Great Lakes Research Center site if you were to to click on research highlights it provides the the background on high frequency radar uh, primer on how it actually works, some of the videos that, that Michigan Tech has produced about this, this site uh, and provides to the general public a background of, of what they're looking at and, and what its purpose is and, and how, how it all works. And obviously this background information is, is part of our continued effort to try and make this uh, public and make make it understandable to the general public and with the ultimate goal of eventually having some sort of a kiosk uh, potentially in the Bridgeview Park uh, facility that would explain the radar since the antenna is is directly outside as you, you see in the picture. Next slide please. Uh, the current update is the transmitter receiver pair on the south side at, at the historic park was not performing up to specifications. So since uh, the straits are currently iced over and there's nothing moving on the surface, we are not seeing uh, any currents below the surface. Uh, so it was an opportune time to do our annual maintenance and that transmitter receiver is, is back to the manufacturer Kodar um, and is due back to us shortly and will be reinstalled so that we are hoping to catch the breakup of ice. One of the research opportunities that the radar produces, uh, if I could have the next slide, please, is we expect to see during breakup, we expect to see ice flows and be able to map ice flows as well. And we're pretty excited about that, is, as is our sponsors from NOAA. Uh, and the Great Lakes Observing System. Next slide. They are, they are so, so excited, excited that they have requested a cost estimate to do a second pair of radars on the east side of the bridge looking east that would then allow total coverage of the entire Straits area. So we've gone from having to convince them that freshwater system and in particular in the Straits of Mackinac is worth investing in to the point now where they are excited to do more. So I asked the board to consider amongst yourselves whether you would continue to support such an activity if it came to be. Um, and the, the goal would be to put, uh, again, another installation preferably on your property on the east side of the bridge uh, looking towards the southeast. And again, we would uh, approached uh, DNR property on the on the south side to do the same. And one other point that has arisen since um, 
since I put together this slide deck is NOAA headquarters in Washington, D.C. is interesting and is interested in having a splash event to, to celebrate the first freshwater system, possibly in July or August, uh, with the idea of inviting not only dignitaries from, from NOAA in Washington, but also our, our senators and congressmen for, for this region. So uh, I, I have a, a request in the Chief Engineer Neff to, to uh, begin to think about whether that, could, that event could occur at Bridgeview Park. So um, I wanted to warn you that that, that request is, is also eminent. Next slide, please. So once again, we, we thank you for, for making your facilities available to us and for being a great partner in this, this effort. And I'm glad to answer questions from the board or anyone else. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Guy. Excuse the technical difficulty there for a minute, but I see some hands come up. Go ahead, Bill. Thank you. Dr. Meadows. Dr. Meadows, this is Bill Millick, and, and you anticipated my question, but uh, I understand that there are very strong currents between Mackinac Island and the Upper Peninsula, and I wanted to ask if any of your current data confirm that, or if this projected uh, monitoring system that you're talking about would confirm the presence of those currents off Mackinac Island. I, I can definitely confirm, confirm that. Uh, when we did the independent risk analysis for the, the state, uh, um, we did an extensive numerical modeling uh, of those flows, and, and there is very definitely very strong flows through there. And we're hoping that this eastern pair of radars will have the ability to reach out that far and actually be able to document those. But I, as you are aware, Mr. Milligan, is a, a deep remnant river channel that, that runs through that gap and that really does concentrate the flows in those areas. Thank you. Are there any other questions? I, I do have a, a semi-question or at least a comment that during your presentation, I thought I heard the request from you, doctor, that you would uh, like to put up another tower in Bridgeview Park there to uh, better track the movement uh, directly east. If, if, yes, the government has requested a cost estimate to do that. Um, the, the original pair was, was cost to about $600,000 to make them operational and we've given a similar quote uh, to the government to fund that operation. The, the second pair of antennas would have to be uh, on the eastern side of the bridge. So one of the ideal locations would be essentially at the base of your, your dock uh, at the maintenance facility. Um, and again, it would be a, a wooden enclosure like we had created for Bridgeview Park, but the antenna and the transmitter receiver uh, would be at that location. Then, Kim, would it be appropriate right now to give uh, permission to install the uh, East Tower at our property there, just so we don't have to hold up uh, any progress in uh, the possible erection of that tower? Can you turn the fences right there next to the dock between us and the city? Mm -hmm. Well, it so, seems like we have enough frontage there on uh, somewhere on the east side of the bridge. It, it may not have to go way over to the dock if possible, but I understand your concerns. I was looking at it from the perspective, if it works and uh, it meets all the needs of uh, the, the request here, would it be uh, a way to expedite so we don't have to wait for another meeting in order yeah. to uh, give the approval? I hadn't known that this was going to come up okay. at this meeting. So, but yes, you're right. Having pre-approval, yes. and then have us investigate where it should go. Mr. Chairman, could I make that motion? It says the the authority 
um, grants the uh, permission to put the additional tent, uh, antenna on the property subject to working out the details with the bridge director. Thank you. Support for that motion? It's been moved supported. Is there any discussion on the motion? All in favor of the motion, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Thank you. Thank you. That was amazing. It, just, yeah, it's just it, amazing. it is amazing, <laughs> this data. Nice work. Nice work. Any other comments, questions? All set? Well, thank, thank you, me. Dr. Meadows. We really appreciate your reports and your time and effort that you're putting into this project. Thank you. And, and thank you the, and the board. I, I didn't mean to force a vote. I just meant to alert you that the government is is thinking and desiring to possibly do this. Uh, it's tremendously eight, refreshing we have, vote uh, to, to have your agenda eight, We have the annual inspection report. Uh, again, Cole. Uh, back again. But um, so all the board members should have received their annual, their physical annual inspection report by now, so I'll try to keep this short, kind of be the cliff notes of the annual inspection report. Um, so first of all, uh, I want to just touch on, we had a brand new team doing our annual inspection this year, um, a team out of, uh, from a company called HGR Michigan Inc. out of Ann Arbor. Um, so HGR is a very well-known engineering company. Uh, their project manager on our inspection contract, uh, Kuang Lim, has done a lot of work on the Golden Gate Bridge and their inspection lead, Jason Fogg, who I believe is in that lower right picture up there on the cables, uh, has done a lot of suspension inspection and inspection work, yeah, in New York, yep. So uh, they were on site from July 19th to August 6th when, of course, the weather is the nicest in the Straits. Uh, it comes with some difficulties because that's also when we have the highest traffic, but we were able to get it done, and the big takeaway is the bridge was, again, found to be in an overall good condition, which uh, for a bridge that, that age is, is, is great news. So uh, one thing I wanted to hit on was we did have one, uh, what I'll call a priority finding uh, this year. It was a uh, cross beam that was found to be cracked, and HDR reported that to a Julian I the day they found it and of course it was a Friday and uh, we uh, took but we were able to take care of it and within 24 hours we had it completely supported I was on site that Saturday morning with Joe Champagne our maintenance supervisor and uh, Paul Matelski who was a longtime crew leader for us who has since retired so we wish him the best but uh, we were down underneath putting in uh, temporary supports as you can see in this picture on the right so immediately we wanted to get that supported and um, I just want to hit on this, although this was found during the annual inspection, this area and what caused this has been well known to us for a long time. Um, it's a, kind of a unique aspect of the Mackinac Bridge is that we have short transition spans between our main span and our backstay spans. And it's a unique feature that even among suspension bridges is is pretty unique and we've had issues because of that because there's just a lot of movement there and so over the years they've tried different things and in uh, the late 90s um, Julie could speak to exactly when I believe is 97 they installed uh, what we call the link bolt assemblies so that's actually what's seen in the picture on the left they're basically very strong long bolts that help push and pull that transition span to, to accommodate the movement in the bridge but for whatever reason uh, when they installed these, there was a couple locations, not all of them, but a couple locations where they cut out through the crossbeam um, as part of the installation. And you can kind of see it in that picture where it's that rectangular section. So that's not a crack. That's actually something they cut out. And in civil engineering, we try not to have right angles in steel and things because we go with curves to help distribute the forces because right angles tend to crack, and that's exactly what we've seen. So it's an area we've been monitoring for a long time, and uh, this one did eventually crack, and uh, like I said, we were able to take get it temporarily supported within 24 hours, and then uh, next slide. Did that crack through the weld? I'm assuming that's a weld that was around that? Yeah, yeah. yep. 
Okay. Yep, so it did crack there. Um, so that was the immediate support we had on it. We had three of those jacks underneath the beam. And then we went back in and within a couple of weeks had that picture on the left, which is a, a bolted steel support that, because we didn't want to keep those jacks out there forever. Um, and in this picture, we cleaned up the steel when we went in there to, to, clean, uh, to put these in. And it really shows what I'm talking about, about that cutout. Because in the, in the top right of that photo by the link bolt assembly, you can see that very dark right angle line. So that's not a crack. That's part of that. For whatever reason, when they installed those, they, they cut those out. And unfortunately, that's, that's caused issues for us. Um, but we also wanted to be preemptive. So the other locations where we have this detail, we, out, we went in and the picture on the right up there, that's not the location where that beam cracked. That's a different location that we went in. We put a secondary beam. We already painted it, so it, it so blends in, but that's a brand new beam underneath there to take the pressure off that beam and prevent more issues like that. So we installed a few of those this fall and we have a couple more this spring we're gonna do just to reinforce those areas and not have that issue again. So, next slide. Um, another aspect of the annual inspection I wanna hit on is the grading. You hear a lot of grading <laughs> from us, but uh, it is aging and as you can see, in the table below, we've been replacing more and more. And basically, just to hit on that, during the annual inspection, we have inspectors walk the entirety of the grading and they give each individual panel a grade. And once a panel reaches a certain grade, yeah, yeah it means it's due for replacement. So it, it doesn't necessarily mean it's, it's get it out of there, it's replace this one within a year. So, uh, in that table up there, that's an example of what it looks like. That red one, of course, means replace it. Uh, the gray in that table means we have replaced it. So as we replace more and more of the grading, um, you can kind of see in that the picture on the right, the bridge is becoming kind of a quilt work because we don't paint the new panels because they're galvanized, so they already are corrosion resistant. So, so they stand out a little bit because they're gray, but. Um, it's something that we, we do every year and we're, we're keeping up on it. Next slide. Um, other than that, I just want to reiterate the annual inspection is it's a very comprehensive. We look at the entirety of the bridge. So these are just some pictures from the report um, that show we, they look at the deck, they look at the piers, they even look at the plaza, the toll plaza. And it's, it's very comprehensive and it's just, uh, a way for us to make sure the bridge is in as good a condition as it can. We use the annual inspection to figure out what our maintenance items are gonna be the next summer. And um, this year, as you can tell by that priority finding, it, it did its job. It let us take care of some issues. So, next slide. Uh, we're already working on this year's upcoming <laughs> annual inspection. Uh, annual inspection never, it, it's every year. so. Uh, this year we are having Parsons. Our current contract for inspections is shared between Parsons and HDR and they alternate inspection years. And that's just a, that was established a few years ago um, to get new eyes on the bridge and keep new perspectives. And it's just a way to get as comprehensive of an inspection as, as we possibly can. So it'll probably take place in, in July, or early August as is typical. And uh, we're looking forward to that. So any questions? You identified one uh, priority area for repair. How many other cross beam candidates are there for repair? So we, we, d we zoned in on those locations where they had that cutout. And like I said, it's, it's not every one. So there's 16 total link bolts, but only um, nine of them have those cutouts. So we've already either repaired or re uh, reinforced um, six of them. So we have three more five of them and we have four more to do this spring uh, and like I said it's mostly precautionary just to make sure that we don't have any more uh, major cracks and uh, just to reiterate the cross beams as we've talked about before that they've been something on the bridge that um, we've monitored over the years and 
the good news is they're when they designed the bridge, they're very um, they had a very large factor of safety. So um, even the fact that if one were to crack, just to it, it's there's so many that it, there's a lot of redundancy there. And but it's something we don't we obviously don't want to keep happening. So we're trying to take care of that. Thank you. Yeah. Go ahead, Amy. Um, yeah, I think of a routine bridge inspection as like going to my doctor's once a year for my annual checkup, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not 65 yet, but this bridge is turning 65. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I guess if I was at the doctor and there was a, a priority repair, which I call a critical finding, mm -hmm. I would want to know about it. So mm -hmm. or I, t I tell my family about it, right? Mm -hmm. The Mackinac Bridge Authority is your family. Mm -hmm. We, and I, I may be wrong. If you guys don't agree, that's fine. But for something like this, you know, I, I would recommend that the qualified team leader doing this inspection follow M M MDOT's guidelines mm -hmm. for routine or fracture critical or whatever bridge mm -hmm. guidelines and generate a request for action, which mm -hmm. is an RFA. They did the right thing. They called you first. Mm -hmm. You guys were on it. You took care of it. There's no issue, so maybe you don't think we want to know, but I would want to know, and mm -hmm. I'd want to document it in the RFA format, so that way over time you can see the systematic issues, or maybe it's not systematic, it was done and dressed, mm -hmm. but it documents the history of the maintenance of the bridge in a different format than just this huge binder. Yeah. You know? Yeah, and that's, um, that's a very good point, and it's something that um, we thought of um, afterwards, and I guess the reason we didn't necessarily go that route is by definition a uh, critical finding is that a bridge either requires to be closed or a lane right. requires to be closed and yep. we did not deem that um, necessary okay. so although we considered sure. it a priority and yeah. we jumped on it right away okay um, no that's great that we didn't consider sense. it a critical you're, you're finding. absolutely right I guess if we have one of these priorities I wouldn't mind getting an email about it um, yeah. just so I'm aware of it I, you know, and, and mm -hmm. if you guys think that that's boring stuff, I mean, I'm a bridge geek, so I love this stuff. <laughs> yeah. Would that be appropriate to, to ask you guys to just communicate with us when something like this happens? Yeah, no, that's uh, something we can definitely do, and Perfect. and hopefully you don't hear from us. So yeah, yeah, exactly. No news is good news. When I go to the physical, yeah. they're like, oh, this was an easy one. That's great. Yeah. You know, keep doing what you're doing, yeah. and and keep up the great job with the maintenance. You guys are you. really doing a wonderful job. Any other comments, questions? Of, uh... Okay, Cole, thank you very much for thank your, you. your report. Uh, excellent work, thank you. And please pass that along to all the individuals out there working every day on that bridge. Okay, number nine, uh, we have some uh, legislative issues that we've been dealing with. Kim, you're going to give that report for us? Yep, I'll give that report. Um, one thing I wanted to mention with the annual inspection report is if you ever don't want your annual inspection report that we give you, if you want to turn it back in, then we'll mark you off because there's they're assigned specifically to you. So just wanted to remind you of that. <laughs> <laughs> you're welcome to turn them back in. Okay, our legislative report. Um, we have had quite a bit of action in that regard lately. Um, all the bills that we're going to be talking about are under tab 9 in your booklet. Um, if you'll remember, House Bill 4165 and 4782 relate to farm implements on the bridge, allowing those to cross the bridge. And um, we did some testimony in the Committee on Transportation, um, the Mackinac Bridge Authority and MDOT, opposed that bill, so we testified against that bill and thankful for MDOT's participation in, in that, helping us with that. And so that was the last um, thing that happened with that bill is we testified in the Committee on Transportation. It has not been uh, voted out of there. Um, the other one, Bill 5363, allows for an optional prepaid electronic pass system which, as you know, we've already had uh, prepaid systems since 1987, but this is specific to the EasyPass system, and it would allow us not to capture any enrollment fees or increased tolls or um, 
anything like that. And so that bill was introduced um, back in October, and it was referred to the Committee on Transportation, but they have not scheduled any hearing or anything on that yet. Um, the final one I want to report on is the House Bill 5315, which I guess is now in the Senate, so it's not called the House Bill anymore. But um, that has passed through the House. We testified um, in support of that. Um, it has to do with uh, designating the Mackinac Bridge along with other bridges in the state as key facilities so that we can prosecute trespassers as a felony offense instead of a misdemeanor offense. And so that passed out of the House and into the Senate. And so it's referred to the Senate Committee on Transportation and Infrastructure right now. So we're hoping it keeps moving. There's a lot of uh, momentum with it. So we're hoping to see it keep going. And um, as I said, those the language of those bills are in your um, in your booklet along with an analysis. Trish. Thanks, Kim, for the update. So if I could ask maybe two questions, and I'll do them in reverse order. So the penal code bill is in the Senate. Has Troy given any indication of when a hearing in the Senate the, might be? Which one, excuse me? Uh, I'm sorry, the 5315, the penal code regarding the oh. trespassing. Has he given us any indication about when a hearing? No. Okay. Yeah. But I will certainly let you know because it's it's very nice to have support in the room when we do have to testify. Yeah, yeah. and to get that done right. as soon as possible. For sure. Especially in the House, it was it was obvious. I don't know what the final vote was, but at least in committee, it was uh, a slam dunk. Uh, yeah, it was a yeah. slam dunk, well put. So, right. um, and then on the same sort of the same question about the um, 4165 and 4782, the implements of husbandry, that clearly in committee uh, at least hopefully it was eye-opening that there's a lot more than meets the eye with that bill um, do you know the status have we kind of do you think that may be put to bed or is there a lot more churning going on that that may still come up uh, there was a slight amount of churning going on at right after our testimony yeah. but uh, shorty and I <laughs> met uh, with the legislator and kind of um, took care of that and so it seems to be just languishing right now good thank you yeah any other questions from uh, the authority members I, I've got a couple brief comments number one I want to thank Kim for all the work that she's put into this and also the authority members that have taken the time to go down there and uh, speak to senators representatives and attend public hearings on these bills thank you all for your time that you've spent on this uh, under new business, the events, uh, Michael, you're up uh, for the uh, special events. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Uh, a little lighter topic. Good morning, everybody. A little lighter topic this morning. Uh, 2022 special events. Um, as you probably know, we have several special events every year. Uh, a lot of these are annual events. Um, they're very successful for the surrounding communities. Uh, they benefit all the local businesses. Uh, it also benefits the Mackinac Bridge in the form of increased traffic, increased revenue. Um, and since I participate on site in all these events myself, there is um, a lot of energy and enthusiasm um, the people that participate in these events and work directly with the uh, Mackinac City Chamber of Commerce, the St. Agnes Chamber of Commerce, uh, the Visitors Bureau, uh, they do a great job of promoting these events to benefit the local communities. Um, and we work with those also. I communicate with these uh, organizations frequently. Um, and just to touch on them, it looks like there's about nine of them uh, starting in May. Um, we don't have a lot during the summer uh, due to increased traffic volume. Uh, we kind of have a full slate without special events, but uh, I personally enjoy them. Um, we have one in May, one in June, one in July, one in August. And then you can see September's a busy month. We have it every weekend in September. 
um, starting with our annual bridge walk. Um, and then uh, the tractor parade is kind of the, one of the larger events of the year. Uh, typically a kind of slow pace, low key, great group of people, uh, about 1,500 tractors. It takes us four to six hours to process this. Uh, it's a long event, uh, but people uh, that watch it and participate really enjoy it. Uh, it's a great fall event. Uh, it's been going on for several years, uh, sponsored by the Owasso Tractor Club. Um, they do a great job. Uh, we follow that up with a semi uh, parade. Um, that event's in the local Senegnes area. That's a big uh, weekend for the surrounding communities. Um, really popular. Again, the weather's ideal. Um, great group of people. Um, the bridge enjoys having them. Um, the ATV crossing follows that up. Uh, that continues to grow. Uh, that's one of those events that the board approved in years past. Started out kind of small and the interest has really taken off. A um, lot of repeat crossers, um, a lot of interest, um, and the authority does a, a nice job of processing them, um, keeping the public safe and keeping the participants safe at the same time. Um, the end of the year, we do our antique snowmobile crossing. We just had this event recently. Uh, kind of a unique event, having snowmobiles cross the bridge. It's a fairly small event. We had, I don't know, 40, 50 snowmobiles. But um, again, I'm on site, and uh, the small group that does participate, boy, they, they, love, they love it. They really do. Uh, and that goes for all the events. Uh, the, the Jeep, the Mac, as a, our first event, that has really grown, uh, very popular, so much so that they typically had this in the spring, April or May, they would hold that event. Um, it got pushed off due to COVID, as you know. Um, so they did it in the fall, the last year or two years, they did it in the fall, and that tied in with the color tour. And there was so much interest. The Jeep, the Mac, they're gonna have two a year now through the Visitors Bureau. They're gonna keep the traditional one in the spring, which we participate in, and now there's going to be one in the fall, which they have great interest. They don't have a bridge crossing in the fall, but it is an organized event, and uh, they're going to be in the area, and they, they almost like the one in the fall better. So that's one good thing that came out of COVID. <laughs> um, Muscle on the Mac is our annual car show, which has taken place for many, many years. Uh, it's one of our largest weekends of the year at the bridge. Uh, we have tremendous traffic. Um, used to be a Saturday, Sunday thing, and then it turned into a, more of a Thursday through Monday, and it's and that led into a Wednesday to Tuesday, and you see where I'm going with that. Um, so yeah, the um, special events, um, I think they're just uh, a lot of positive. I'm glad the board approves these events, um, and then that'll lead into the next uh, topic there I have on uh, um, number 11 which is an action item, uh, special event proposals. Um, Kim and I have had communication with two different uh, groups by email, uh, phone, and the first one uh, I'll mention, this has come up in the past and it's resurfaced, um, a golf cart crossing. I know these are widely popular in the southern states. Um, this particular one uh, they reached out to Kim initially. Uh, she got with me. Uh, we've reached out to this group that was trying to put this together. Um, we spoke to one individual. Um, it's kind of fell by the wayside. We've, we've reached out to them. Uh, we've invited them to our today's meeting. Um, we just haven't had good communication. Uh, it's been several months. Uh, we put a good faith effort into reaching out to them by various means and um, outside of that initial communication where they said they were thinking about it, I just don't think it has organized into or matured into anything at this point. I can see it resurfacing. We'll probably talk about this again in the future. 
Uh, that particular event, I, I don't think there's any action needed on it. Um, uh, the last event I'll mention, which is uh, a little more fun to talk about, uh, I won't speak to it at length. Um, again, an action item, Stanley Steamers Crossing. Um, I'm sure Bill will appreciate this because there's some histor history behind it. Um, we're all familiar with steam-powered trains and steamboats. I mean, they've been around for many years. Um, this group is a little more organized, uh, Stanley Steamers. Uh, our contact is uh, Jill Kenobi. Uh, we had had good communication with her, unlike the other event. Uh, we've been texting, and Kim and I had a long phone call with her recently. Um, they are a little behind in their planning. Um, they are planning on crossing Central Upper Peninsula the third week of September of this year. Um, they hope to get more information to us in April or May as they confirm and shore up their plans. Um, just a little backstory: they're talking 25 to 30 vehicles of these Stanley steamers. Uh, these cars were produced in the 1903 to 1925 era. Um, just some uh, quick history on it. Uh, the company was uh, created by a set of twin brothers. Coincidentally, their last name is Stanley. <laughs> um, these original cars, um, they had 200 orders for them. Um, these steam-powered cars, 13 moving parts. So kind of, kind of interesting. They produced these vehicles for 25 years, which at that time was probably pretty substantial. And uh, I found this interesting. They made 86 different models, which for that time frame I thought was really neat. Uh, the last thing I wanted to mention on the Stanley Steamers, um, one of their achievements, uh, the owners, they climbed Mount Washington, which is 7.6 miles, Bill, Mount Washington, and guess how long it took them? Two hours and 10 minutes to go seven miles uphill. So they're slow moving vehicles. Um, I hope that uh, Kim and I will continue to communicate with this group. Uh, you'll let this be part of our special events. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing them. Maybe uh, you guys can be in the area and it's uh, these are rare vehicles. In restored condition, they're 150 to $200,000. Wow. So this is a unique group that uh, I don't think you're going to see them going down the road very often. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Mike. A very thorough, uh, detailed report. And, and really, we'd like to also thank you for all the work and time and effort you put into all those events. The reason why they run so smoothly is because you've organized them and worked with the group so well. Well, thank so you, Shardy. We, we wanted to thank you I for appreciate that. that. Go ahead, uh, Bill. With respect to Stanley Steamer, I wanted to add that Stanley Steamer set a land speed record in Daytona that exceeded 100 miles an hour. I can't remember what the speed was, but in the, in the day, that was a pretty fast little critter. Wow. They come a long way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And I've got one other question. Okay. December 10th, antique snowmobile crossing. Henry Ford didn't invent the snowmobile. <laughs> What's an antique snowmobile? <laughs> well, the, these snowmobiles are typically 60s and 70s models. Um, they're, I've seen them cross, and I, I, the newest model you're going to see is probably a John Deere produced in 1970. There's, mm. there's not much newer than that. Um, the museum is in, is it Nobinway, the museum, just west of St. Agnes? Uh, they have quite an exhibit out there. If you ever get a chance to stop there, um, they have a large display of antique snowmobiles, a uh, real proud group of what they created there. And um, a, a lot of the sleds that participate in that event are from that club and that group. Well, I've learned something today. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Just so you know, to me, antique snowmobile is it doesn't have handlebar warmers <laughs> or <laughs> seat warmer. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I, 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 
this was particularly interesting because when I saw it on the agenda, I was thinking it was a caravan of yellow carpet cleaning vans. Oh, well, this is so that was really good. Yeah, and, we went, and I also we went learned that I also yeah. learned that the '60s and '70s are now antiques. So I'm wondering what that means for many of us at this table. So <laughs> it's self-explanatory. Uh, Thank you. Is there any, any other comments or questions good. about Mike's report? If not, I think a motion would be in order to allow the uh, Stanley's, Stan, Stanley steamers to be part of the uh, activities at the bridge sometime in September or whatever date they choose. I would be honored to make that motion, Mr. Chair. I'll support that motion. It's been moved and supported. Is there any further discussion on the motion? Hearing none. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Thanks again, Mike. Okay, uh, 200. Well, I'm sorry. I don't want to interrupt, but I think when, Kim, you did your the legislative update, there is a um, sovereign tribal governmental permit procedure in the back. Is that just for information? Because that's great. I just want to make sure the board saw that in there. Okay. Yep. All right. You do read your binder? Yes, okay. All right. Yes. I, I'm the only one that didn't. <laughs> Kim. Okay, uh, this is another fun one. Uh, item 12 in your booklet is talks about the 200 millionth vehicle on the Mackinac Bridge. So we expect that to happen uh, mid June. That that vehicle will come come across the bridge. And if you look in your um, packet and up here, you can see what happened uh, when we did the 150th million vehicle. So we had a little celebration. Uh, you can see uh, Shorty in the picture there, Larry Rubin and uh, former member Barbara Brown, as well as Bob Sweeney, and must be the winner there uh, mm -hmm. accepting the booklet. But uh, we'd like to do something very similar to that, and so um, we'll be getting together with both communities to create gift baskets and fine-tuning the date of that vehicle, and we'll let everybody know when they should be expected so that you can come up and help us celebrate if you're able to. So th just wanted to let you know that this was happening. Thank you. That can I ask a quick question, Mr. Chair? Yes. Kim, so is this, um, I'm just curious, this is very cool. Is this a spontaneous thing where you have the person tell the person when they come or it's not a carefully choreographed spontaneous event? It's, it's a, a spontaneous, spontaneous thing. Okay. We you know wow. we keep our traffic counts so we'll so know you know you the, the yeah. next which vehicle is going to be so we and we'll be able to predict it pretty closely too we literally walked right out to them and they were and as, as shocked as could be and had and them pull over come and off. That's great. it was really a nice nice event really i yeah. i can't believe there's already been 50 million more yeah <laughs> right. the they keep on coming I, I, my count is way off. Okay, uh, very good. Thank you, Kim. Uh, next item is strictly information, uh, informational, and it's uh, for the uh, meet, upcoming meetings are July 20th and 21st. We'll be at the island in the 3rd and 4th of 2022. We'll be in Ann Arbor. Is there any other business to come before the authority? I do have a couple announcements. Announcements. Um, if there's no further public comment, no further public comment. Uh, number one is I wanted to start with our bridge director, uh, Kim Nowak. Uh, as you know, she wasn't in attendance last night because she was uh, receiving an award from the WTS Michigan chapter of, for Woman of the Year. And uh, congratulations, Kim. <laughs> and what was unique? about that uh, ceremony and the presenter was a former member of the Mackinac Bridge Authority, Barbara Ahrens, which is, yeah. she's the president of the MTS. Yeah. So it was a very, very nice deal and an award uh, that you certainly are worthy of. Thank you very much. So, and number two, we, we've got a, uh, obviously uh, something starting here every quarterly meeting that uh, another member of the authority is, is getting another award uh, from Michigan Tech, and that would be our vice chair, Amy, will be later in March, I believe, yeah. will be inducted into the Michigan Tech Civil and Environmental Engineering Academy. 
obviously uh, her leadership skills and her professional uh, uh, work as an engineer certainly has paid off and uh, we'd like to congratulate you Amy as well do you want to take a minute to explain something? I just want to hide under the table it's like I hate opening presents <coughs> in front of people and this makes me a little uncomfortable but I am so grateful to that college it really created me to be a good problem solver and I I'm super grateful for it so I Thank you. I hope I get tassels or something. <laughs> 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 I get Kim no tassels. Uh, Kim, Kim's already been inducted, and I don't think there are that many women that have been inducted, so I'm, I'm proud to represent our gender. Well, very good. Congratulations, Kim. Or er, Amy, I'm sorry. And I, I want to say this real briefly because I'll hold off my comments until July, uh, but this will officially be my last meeting. Uh, with the authority and I wanted to thank you real briefly right now and there'll be more detail in July so thank you very much if if there's no further business a motion to adjourn would be in order go ahead quick, <laughs> Very quick. mr. chairman I think uh, I want to say at least on behalf of all of us and maybe everyone else wants to say something but how much we appreciate your leadership and you will be sorely missed well, I won't go you. on and on but uh, you've been a great asset to this board while we're here all of us and long before us and we really appreciate it well thank you very much and I'll go more into detail in July thank you Shorty you're an institution second only to the bridge itself <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Who's older? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. Boy, I tell you, that is close. Good point. <laughs>